from standardized tests to teacher vaccines to the future of education. I talk one-on-one -on -one with Superintendent of Education, Molly Spearman, for this edition of Quentin's Close-Ups. And if you haven't already, subscribe to my YouTube channel and like Quentin's Close-Ups on Facebook. Superintendent of Education, Molly Spearman. Welcome to Quentin's Close-Ups. Thank you, Quentin. I'm so glad to be on with you. Today. Yes, ma'am. I, you know, I always wanted to interview you, so here I am, the grace welcome. of God. <laughs> Me too. Here I am by the grace of God. Yes, yes. Who is Molly Spearman these days? <laughs> um, I think she is uh, a mature woman mm. who uh, has been involved in education all of her career, uh, government, most of her career and I'm to a stage in my life where I really am focused on why am I doing this job I chose to do this I felt it as a calling and I'm doing it because I want to make sure that we're doing the best we can for all students in South Carolina and I have a particular burden for rural students uh, in small communities because that's where I grew up uh, that's where I chose to go back to live with my own children and I have seen the disparities and I know that some of them still exist and I want to do everything I can to overcome those disparities uh, while I'm serving in this job. What are the disparities right now in the rural counties that you know of? Mm -hmm. Well, opportunities uh, are the difference. And it comes from many different things. It's difficult to get. We have some great teachers out in the rural areas, but often keeping them because they get enticed by districts that are close by who can pay more money. Um, resources, facilities are often a disparity uh, where the buildings are not at the level they should be. Um, and those are the areas that I think the state has to come in and take a more, uh, take a stronger role because those communities just cannot afford to do it on their own. And right now, facilities in South Carolina, it's up to the local community. Sure. And we've got local communities, no matter how much they raise their taxes, they would not have the funding to build the type of facilities that these students and teachers deserve. So that's one major area, technology. That came so obvious during the pandemic. We've come a long way in the last year. We've made tremendous progress, but still that disparity. And some of that is just the reality of living way out in the middle of nowhere, like I like to do. <laughs> and so it's difficult. It's expensive to put lines in. But we've got to find a way to do it. And so we have come, uh, we've made some tremendous progress over this last year. I'm really thrilled about that. But, um, you know, we still have a ways to go. Should the state of South Carolina make internet a utility? Well, it could be, uh, you know, it, it's not regulated mm -hmm. now. Um, I think that is a reason that, you know, and I understand when companies there, they have to make a profit and they serve where it's profitable. Sure. So that means people like me who live 30 miles from a Walmart right. may not have the access that others and you give those that up. But yes, I, I, I won't go so far as to say that, okay. but I think the state has a ha, does have an obligation mm. to make sure that all citizens have access to the internet because it is as important as the electricity was back in the 1920s and 30s. Same kind of thing. Mm. And unless the government gets involved to support that infrastructure in the rural areas, it will not happen. So uh, if that takes some kind of regulation, yes, but I hope, I think with the collaboration and the support from the state and federal government now, uh, and Congressman Clyburn's been really involved with this, as you know, I think the funding will is not going to be an excuse in longer. The money is going to be there to do it, the will to get it done, in the most efficient way is what we have to make sure we do now. That brings me to my next question. Where exactly should fiber lines be placed in rural areas? Well, in my rural area, they're on the telephone poles. Mm. Uh, uh, I, I live on Mid-Carolina Co-op Line, and thank goodness they were very progressive and took this on as a project mm. with, they call it Carolina Connect. Right. And to get out to my house way out in the country, uh, it was put on the telephone lines. Oh. I know that's not, uh, that's 
still expensive. Mm. Underground is better, but that's even more expensive. Uh, some areas of the country, uh, there's lots of innovation going on. Uh, Elon Musk right now is working with the tele technology right. being off of satellites, wow. and, and uh, that certainly will be part of this in the future. I know the state of Mississippi he's working sure. with. So there are lots, there's a lot of innovation, a lot of growth here. I would say, where does it need to be put? Wherever it is most efficient, but it needs to cover the entire state of South Carolina. Where exactly should hotspots be placed? Hotspots right now, we have over 100,000 of those that we've put out to families right. who did not have access. Uh, we're paying the rent on those for families who couldn't afford it. There may be additional families who need it and still can't afford it. So we're looking at that with our additional federal funding that we can support families, either through the funding that the districts get uh, or that the state gets. But hotspots need to be put in houses that have students or teachers who don't have access to the internet and a hotspot would, would make it happen. It doesn't work everywhere, but some places are so remote that even the hotspot doesn't help. Right. So um, it's not an easy fix, right. but certainly I think with working with everybody at the table trying to say we're going we're here to fix it, we're not going to compete for who gets the job. Let's whoever can do it most efficiently and economically and quickest, let's let them do that work. What is the typical funding for each of those school districts? Well, it ranges, uh, and there are different pots of money. You know, sales tax in South right. Carolina uh, funds education uh, here in our state. Uh, it's kind of a we had a we had a three pronged school uh, stool with sales tax, right. income tax, right. and property tax. Right. Property tax was taken away, extra penny. That's never really mm -hmm. come to total fruition. So it's been a lot of discussion there. And then there's a big federal pot of money that comes in. Um, in the state, that's appropriated on a formula, which takes into account many things, the ability of the districts to, of that community to pay. Uh, we recently, in the last few years, added a poverty weighting. So those Communities that have a greater in density of poverty get additional funding as well. So uh, a formula uh, per pupil, right. and then, of course, there's additional programs, additional funding that's there, too. It's kind of complicated, and we've talked for a long time. It needs to be simplified so you and I can understand it better <laughs> and explain it better. But uh, it's been band-aided for many, many years, since 1977, when the original Education Finance Act passed. So a lot of band-aids on it, trying, let's fix this, let's fix that, let's fix this. So, you know, I've been saying for the last few years, it's time to really overhaul it. But that's really hard to do, because, the Quentin, the reason is you have people, communities in this state, who are givers and takers. There are a few counties that they raise a lot of money and they fund these wonderful districts and they have to give up some of their money, sure. like Ori, right. Beaufort, uh, to other counties. So, you know, getting those legislators and those communities to support giving away more of their money <laughs> to lesser districts, mm -hmm. you know, it takes, uh, it takes a real thoughtful and bold and uh, very statesmanlike decisions to be made to make that happen. But I think it's time for us to have that conversation. And I want to continue that on, on another day. But let me talk to you, obviously, about the General Assembly. As you know, the General Assembly repealed teaching to the Common Core Standards, but the use of the Act, obviously, the ACT is aligned to the Common Core Standards. Hmm. Why wouldn't the state adopt a more age grade and the developmentally appropriate standardized tests like Iowa in which it's not aligned to Common Core and most private school uses. Okay. Well, we have different assessments. We adopted new standards when, uh, while I was running campaigning and then at, officially after I got elected right. in, in January and February of 2015. Right. So we do have our own South Carolina standards, uh, not just in the assessments, but uh, is an issue, but uh, instructional materials. Mm. In fact, this year we still have some textbooks that have not been replaced to align with our new standards. They're, so we're asking for a hundred million dollars from the legislature right. to finish off the new purchase, the purchase of the correct textbooks. So that's an issue. 
as far as the assessments, our state assessments that we give are aligned to our own standards. They are not aligned to Common Core. Uh, the SC Ready tests that we give to three through eight. Those national tests, ACT, SAT, uh, we use both, ACT, SAT, um, and they are aligned uh, to to different standards. Uh, there, right now, there's no other college entrance exam right. that I know of for us to be using. So that's why the continual use of those. But I will say, even at the higher ed level, you're seeing more and more colleges and universities moving away from right. standardized tests uh, like ACT, SAT to for the weighting. They've used they've used it as a very heavy weight in the selection of students. They're moving away from that. And I think looking more at grade point averages of students, the actual work they've done, student portfolios, uh, students really explaining, here's who I am, yes, more than just a test score. Right. So I think in the next few years, you're going to see fewer and fewer uh, or lesser uh, impact of those tests. How much do you all actually spend on these spend standardized tests? <laughs> well, a good bit. Um, I don't have the number right in front of me, but I would say 10 to 12 million a year probably on the on the state assessments. Uh, we do pay for every high school junior or senior whenever they choose to take the college entrance exam. We pay for that. Uh, we also pay for a career assessment uh, for them to show their work skills. Sure. So all that, you know, the state pays for is, you know, any money is significant, but it's not a huge amount uh, in, in when you look at the total budget, but somewhere I w estimate, and I could get the exact figure for sure. you, but somewhere in the 10 to $15 million range. Why are the results of these tests not immediately immediately available as the results are known until this next start of the okay. school year? Well, and that's something I'm really concerned. There are okay. two different kinds of tests. Okay. Uh, the state pays for the summative test, mm. which is a summary right. test at the end of the year. Uh, that's the one that I had hoped we would not be giving mm. <laughs> this, this spring because of the pandemic. Uh, we pay for that. Uh, it is a very extensive test. Some of it actually has student handwritten or type right. uh, writing examples. It takes a while to score. Sure. Uh, we're doing a quicker job uh, than we were, but it does take several weeks and months for the schools to get that information back, and that's why it's not so helpful to the school they can look at it as an overview of how well they're doing compared to other schools in the state and in the nation. But it's not a lot of assistance for a for the, the child and the teacher relationship and what needs to be done immediately in the classroom. Mm -hmm. So that's why we have interim assessments, right. or some people call them formative assessments. Right. Some districts, there's five or six different right. ones. MAP is oh, one, yes. iReady is one right. that districts use. Those give immediate feedback to the teachers, if not the day of, at least the next day. They're more in depth, the teachers, they teach a little, or, you know, for several weeks, right. then they give the assessment to see how how are their students doing on these aligned standards moving toward this big test at the end of the year. Um, I have fought and thought strongly that that information, usually that's kept in the district. Mm. Because of the pandemic and us needing to know where our students are, the legislature required districts this year to share that information mm. with us. So we have that data from the August assessment, right. from the December assessment, and we know and we contracted with a group called Education Analytics to analyze that data and really give us how, the, how would the students have done had they taken those summative tests that day? Mm -hmm. And we really can predict that. And so that's why I felt like we had enough information this year that we did not need to go through the summative process. It wasn't that I didn't think we need to assess. Absolutely, we kind of know where the kids are. But I felt that South Carolina is way ahead of the game in most, and really all states, with our analysis that we could have gotten by. So. Um, the teachers do get their data, and of course they'd give their own teacher-made tests 
pop quizzes that probably you, I know I have yes. to take them. I bet yes. you're not as old oh, as yes. me, but I <laughs> probably took a pop quiz. Oh, yes. too. But these are um, these are not standardized, but they are purchase tests that you can compare with other right. schools, with other um, with other districts, and they're not just teacher made tests. So those do give immediate feedback, but those are paid for right now by the districts. <laughs> Not by the state. They, and I know you have to run, but let me ask you three last questions. I know that now that we obviously have a 10-point grade, grade grading skill, that is, how many more students have qualified for the lottery scholarships? You know, I don't have that exact information. Uh, I know the, that is done at the Commission of Higher Education, okay. and we could get, get the exact number for you. But as we did that shift... Right. Um, the quality of the work still had to be at an A level. It doesn't necessarily mean that students made, you know, now we're making uh, a B turned into an A. It's more of the spread and how teachers did the grading within and their quality. What kind of work did they need to do to make an A? Now it's going to be spread out over 10 points sure. versus a 7. What kind of quality of work do they have to do a B? So I think, you know, it takes a little bit to think about that. But um, there was discussion to change the cutoff scores for lottery scholarship. I think the legislature so far has left that as it is. So there may be additional students who have qualified. We'll be glad to get that number for you. And the federal law requires a standardized test, but doesn't require any portion to be used for a student's grade. Why does the state use 20% of the test against a student's GPA? Well, a couple things. Um, and I can argue this point either way, but most teachers that I talked with felt that the student, and they were talking about high school students generally now, a few middle school students now take Algebra 1, English 1 earlier, but generally these are the core curricular that you have to have in order to graduate uh, from a South Carolina high school. And quite honestly, most teachers say you need to put some weighting on it for the students to really take it serious. Okay, if you're going to give this assessment and they know that it's really going to count toward their final grade, they're going to take it a lot more seriously. It is aligned. It does give us some data at the state level to know how well students are doing across the state and give some comparison. So I would say it's, it's mostly just to uh, show the we didn't want it to be, a, you know, and there's some people who thought it should be a pass-fail. Mm -hmm. If you don't pass the test, right. you don't get your credit. Right. I did not support that. But I do think, on the other hand, you have to put some weighting on it so that the test is taken seriously, okay. students do their best, sure. and they know, I've got to really study. Even if I've got an A in this class, it gives us a little uniformity as to how the, the degree of rigor is across the state. So that's why. Now, do you think the Department of Education should take over the charter school approval and monitoring achievement rather than having other agencies like another school district, Erskine, and other institutions of higher learning to take over? Well, the charter school movement in South Carolina, first of all, those are all public schools. Right. They get public dollars. Right. They take the tests. Right. They take all the accountability assessments, just like a traditional school. Um, currently, a local school district can be an authorizer. Mm -hmm. They, if if Saluda County right. felt they needed a charter school, had a niche there, they can authorize it as their own school board. We have a few districts who've done that, but we've also added where other entities can be authorized. Higher education can be an authorizer now. A group of parents hmm. can get together and say, we want to start a school, we want it to focus on STEM or, or whatever, arts, right. whatever it may be, or we want it to focus on just students who are at risk. A lot of, charter schools are supposed to have a different niche hmm. that they serve rather than just what all people and doing all things like our traditional schools have to do. So I think it's working pretty well. Uh, we have two charter districts, the South Carolina Public School Charter District right. and now Erskine, as you mentioned, right. who has recently become a higher ed institute, working pretty well. Um, I don't think the State Department needs to take over all of that. We, we do work with them. Uh, we do have 
uh, staff here who assist when a, a group, a, fam a, a community group wants to start a charter. We can give them assistance in knowing what they need to do and kind of give them guidance along the way because it's not as easy as it looks. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think the role right now that we play is appropriate. Uh, they, they are audited just like other school districts. So um, and the accountability is the same. So I think we have a pretty good uh, setup right now. Um, you know, I, I just, uh, just like a traditional school, there are some charters that are doing exceptionally well, mm -hmm. and there's some charters who are not. Yeah. And uh, if they, they have, uh, I believe it's three years, that if they don't meet their goals, they have to be closed down. Okay. So that's not true of traditional schools, <laughs> you know, but so they have a pretty high bar that they have to serve. I think our job is to make sure that their authorizers, that we're working with their authorizers, making sure that the individual charter schools get the support that they need, mm -hmm. appropriate support, so if it, so that if it ever comes to that level, we can say honestly that we helped and we did what we could. But if it's not working, then they need to be closed. How many money do you? How much money do you think you could save if you align credits under the law? Now, to, to go into that a little bit more. Yeah, how much money do you think we could save if, if we align credits, like, you know, school credits under the law? Um, do you mean as far as their transfer, oh, that, that, that might be able to transfer credits? One of the things that I think we're, that we're working on, and it could be a money saver for students mm -hmm. for sure, uh, I think it's an atrocity that a student might take courses and then they not be transferable to all colleges and universities mm -hmm. in the state. Um, we're working with the technical college system. Mm -hmm. We're working for articulation agreements. Districts are working with their own articulation agreements. And when they, when a student takes a college bearing credit course, right. they need to have, they need to know that if I pass this course, then it's going to be accepted at whether you go to SC State, whether you go to Clemson, right. Lander, Francis Mary, right. University of South Carolina, College of Charleston, wherever it may be. I think most people think that's the case, but that's not necessarily the case. It's getting better. So we need to, we are continually working on that to make sure that the rigor, the quality, the alignment of what needs to be taught in those courses is done so that they will be transferred and accepted into all colleges and universities. That's a big cost saving. You don't want to be spending money on them if that's not the case. And how many teachers have been vaccinated thus far? Um, you know, I don't have the exact number, but I know that all districts have done vaccination okay. clinics. Okay. Um, I think most of them have completed. Uh, for those teachers who want to take the vaccine, right. it has certainly been available to them. Whether the school district or at a clinic in their community and uh, the federal uh, plan is that they can go to any local CBS or oh, Walgreens yeah. and get their shot. So I, I can say pretty confidently at this point, if a teacher wants to be vaccinated and we're encouraging them, not requiring, but we're strongly encouraging them, them to do that, that they should have been able to get their vaccine by now. At least that first shot, if they don't have both shots in their arm yet, at least both. But I, I would think most of them have both their shots. Now, unfortunately, I have to ask this. Um, how many students have actually passed away in South Carolina from COVID? We have had, uh, and, and again, I don't, as of today, to have the exact number. Uh, there have been a few. I think probably less than 10, uh, maybe less than five students, uh, about 10 teachers. Um, but I will say, to my knowledge, and again, this is hard to say confidently, but I know in my personal conversations with those superintendents and, and uh, those families that generally, though, the transmission of the virus did not happen at school. Uh, the person, but the, the the teacher, generally, it happened somewhere else, shopping, right. on a trip, right. church, right. a funeral. Um, 
Now, I, I can't say that 100%, but I can say generally to my knowledge that has been the case. There may be a teacher that has passed from a transmission at school. I know there was a recent coach um, who passed away, and I think possibly, I think maybe grandchildren had, uh, were involved with it. But, but anyway, it's very, very sad when that happens, um, and we grieve with the the family and the district because um, you know teachers uh, are so important in their community so it's very very sad when it happens but overall I will still stand and say that we have been stunned at how safely yes. schools have been able to reopen and that is because of the hard work of the teachers and the principals, the staff, the students wearing their masks. Yes. The students have been so compliant. We were worried about, will the children wear their masks? Oh man, absolutely. You have to tell them to take it off. Mm. I mean, they have they have adapted to this so well that uh, all of us, and here in South Carolina and across the country, I think we have all been shocked at how well, because we really didn't know. Right. We hoped, but we didn't know. Right. But the transmission among school children within the school environment, wearing the mask, keeping the distance sure. as best possible, cleaning, right. tracing, and now adding vaccine to that, uh, school is school is pretty safe. It can never be 100%, but it's pretty darn close. Well, Dan, how many schools are going to, in your mind, get back to face-to-face -to -face by fall? Oh, I hope all of them. My intention and direction is for all of them. Right now, we have all of our districts back in some shape or form face-to-face. Okay. -face. Of our 79 districts, about 55 of them are back full five days a week for everybody. That number goes down to um, about 44 or so that are hybrid. But hybrid means like Greenville, which right. is our largest district, 10% of the state. All of their elementary, middle school students are back five days a week. Their high schools are back four days a week. So they're not counted as a full sure. everybody back, but they're darn close to that. So we have no districts that are all virtual. And out of our 1,266 schools in the state, we only have one that is all virtual, and that is a charter school that has chosen to stay virtual. But all of our schools are offering some form of face-to-face, -face. and I think by, I don't know when your blog airs, but uh, as soon as many of them are coming back from spring break, those 45, many of them are moving to everybody face-to-face. -face. So South Carolina has really done a good job with this, not as quickly in some areas as I thought they should have. Um, there were some communities were hit harder than others, and, and uh, more reluctant to come back, even when the numbers were low. So I had to push pretty hard. <laughs> yes, yes. I had to push pretty hard, and I know it's a big step, uh, but I really, I don't know of anyone who has gone back and regretted it. Mm. Everybody's so glad to be back, right. and once they get back and over that that initial fear, they, they see how well it goes. Let me ask you the final question. Under South Carolina law, we are supposed to have a seedless aligned transition from secondary to higher education, but to graduate from high school, you have to have at least 24 credits, but higher education requires 19 credits. Mm -hmm. How is this law? <laughs> well, I think it happened, and I've been around a long enough time that I remember when it happened. Right. Uh, I guess when I graduated high school years ago, <laughs> I'm thinking I had to have maybe 16, and then, you know, here are two more courses right. you need to take. Went to 18. Uh, then it went to 21, and there for a few years we had what was called a star diploma. Mm. And what changed was block scheduling. Right. When so many schools went from the traditional six courses a day uh, for all year, you know, six a year times four, right. you got 24, right. and that's how you had to pass everything every year to graduate. Mm. <laughs> so when we went to block scheduling, you know, you could take uh, seven, uh, you know, four courses each semester, eight. So eight times four. We have people graduating with 32 units. Right. So I think that was when we changed to say, well, at least let's make it 24, get rid of the STAR diploma, have everybody have one diploma in South Carolina. So it's not difficult at all for students to get those 24 credits. Um, so we do more than we have to do. Okay. Um, 
We do as much as any state in the nation. I don't mm. know of anyone who requires more than us. Some require less. Uh, I'm fine with the 24 credits. Um, there's been a lot of talk, though, uh, with block scheduling. The problem now is students can take all their math maybe in the 8th, ninth, 10th grade, and by the time they go to college, they haven't had a math course since 10th grade. Right. And sometimes that's an issue. So there's legislation before the General Assembly now to say that every senior has to take a math, has to take a language arts course. I, I'm not sure uh, if that will pass this year, but everybody's always looking at it. Uh, I'll just say this. The days are really full. Mm -hmm. um, schools are asked to do a lot, and every year we're asked to do more and more than just content. Uh, our mission is to build really good, happy citizens. So we need to be sure that people, our students can get a job and be successful or they can go right into the workforce, go into the military, be prepared for technical school, college, and then be, live a happy life, you know, and be a contributing citizen. So that is the mission of the profile of the graduate. That's our, that's what we talk about. That's what we try to focus everything on. Are we doing everything possible? and back to how we started, are we doing everything possible to give every student in South Carolina, no matter where they live, the opportunity to meet that goal of being well prepared for college, career, and citizenship when they graduate? Vaccination required or vaccinated recommended? Recommended, strongly. Okay. Marley Spearman, thank you so much for your time. And again, welcome to the award-winning Quintess Close-Ups. Thank you. Glad to be here. Yeah, I hope to do it again. Same here. Yes, ma'am. Thank you.